This video is sponsored by Unity. Blur is an extremely useful and standard technique that all technical artists should keep in their box of tricks. Unity surprisingly doesn't include any blur effect of its own, except for the depth of field, which is a blur based on distance, so it's up to us to make our own. I'll be creating a post-processing effect for URP in this video, and I'm working with Unity 2021. In my last video, I used Unity 2022's full screen shader graph to make a post-processed outline effect. This time, however, I'll be using good old code. Not just because I want to show the difference between using code and using full screen shader graph, but because full screen doesn't yet support multi-pass shaders. And spoiler alert, I'm going to use a two-pass shader for my blur effect. On that note, Unity 2022 LTS is coming soon, and it's bringing a whole bunch of new features and improvements that you might have already seen in the Unity 2022 tech stream. Unsurprisingly, I'm mostly looking forward to the new graphics features coming to URP, especially official supports for custom post-processing effects with the full screen pass renderer feature and full screen shader graph, but also stuff like LOD crossfade, which is going to make visual transitions between LODs a whole lot smoother. Over on HDRP, you've also got the new water system which looks gorgeous and easy to use. There's a Unity blog post all about the LTS which you should go check out. There might be something there that interests you on top of the graphics stuff, it's linked in the description. Right, let's get started by looking at what a Gaussian blur actually is. The Gaussian curve looks like this, and it's described by an equation that looks like this. If you increase the sigma value, the standard deviation, then it'll get stretched outwards, and if you increase the mu value, this fancy little u here, which is the mean, the whole curve moves to the right. It's symmetrical, and these tails technically never touch the axis, but they get very close. You might have heard people call it a bell curve before. You can extend it into three dimensions too, and it sort of looks like you've draped a tablecloth over something. But how does this help us to create a blur effect? Well, here we have an image. For each pixel of the image, we can overlay a grid of weight values based on the Gaussian curve. So there's a large weight in the center that gets smaller as you go outwards. Then multiply the colors of the pixels with their corresponding weight value. Then we sum the new colors and assign the result back to the center pixel on a new image. You move the grid to the next pixel, you do the same, until eventually, the new image contains a blurred version of the first image. This process of overlaying the grid over every pixel like this is called convolution, and the idea is that the weights sum to one, so you end up mixing mostly the center pixel color with bits of the nearby pixel colors which results in a blurred image. The result depends on the shape of the Gaussian curve, Higher spread, which gives us a flatter shape, means there's more blur. There's an alternative called box blur, where instead of Gaussian values, you use 1 over the number of grid pixels as the weight for every pixel, but it doesn't look as nice as Gaussian blur in my opinion. A nice property of the Gaussian blur, and the box blur actually, is that it is linearly separable. Instead of, say, using a 3x3 grid over each pixel, which requires 9 calculations, we can use a 3x1 grid and run it across the image horizontally, then run the same 3x1 grid across the resulting image vertically, and we end up with an identical result with only 6 calculations per pixel. In theory, the grid would have to be infinitely large because, if you remember, the Gaussian curve never touches the axis, so all these pixels out here have tiny but non-zero weights. In practice, these weights are so close to zero, we can ignore most of them. I found that a grid size of about 6 times sigma works, which Wikipedia apparently agrees with. Thanks, Wikipedia. Then I'll round up to the next odd number because our grid needs a center pixel. Let's now dive into Unity and implement the blur. Post-processing effects in URP 
to put it bluntly, are needlessly complicated in code, but it's the best we've got if you need more control than Unity 2022's full screen shader graph. URP renderer features are the magic source that power post-processing effects in URP, including those in my Snapshot Shaders Pro asset pack. We do need that control because we need two passives. I am going to write three scripts and one shader. Blur settings holds the shader properties that we can tweak to our liking. Blur renderer feature handles injecting our custom code into the rendering loop. And blur render pass deals with creating the render textures and actually running a material over the image. Then of course there's the blur shader file which contains the horizontal and vertical passes. That's a lot to get through. Start by creating a new c -sharp script and right clicking and going to create c -sharp script and name it blur settings. First we'll need to import a couple of extra namespaces, unityengine.rendering and unityengine.rendering.universal. I hope they're self-explanatory. Then I'll change the inheritance of the script from monobehavior to volume component and ipostprocess component. Volume component is going to make our effect compatible with the volume system, whereby we can choose to make the effect run globally or only within a certain collider. Without it, the blur would just run all the time, which we probably don't want. We'll need to add a couple of attributes so that we're able to choose our blur effect in the volume effect dropdown, so add system.serializable and volume component menu with whatever path you want. You can include folders in the name, but I'm just going to stick with blur. This script is where we need to add our properties that control the behavior of the blur effect. We only need one property to control the shape of the Gaussian curve. I am going to make it a public clamped float parameter named strength. This takes three parameters, the initial float value and minimum and maximum values. In the inspector, this will be represented as a slider that can only take on values between the min and the max. I'll set the default as 0 and clamp it between 0 and 10. It's good practice to set your properties to a neutral default value so you don't add the effects to your game and then suddenly get a jarring visual change. There are other kinds of parameter type if you need them, clamped or otherwise, like int parameter, color parameter, texture parameter and so on. Try and clamp them if you can, so you don't get people trying to set a strength value of 5 million. The iPostProcess component interface requires us to add two methods called isActive and isTile compatible. In Visual Studio, you can use this little icon to automatically add them. isActive is used to determine whether the effect uses valid variable values, so in this case, the effect should run only if the strength is above 0. We also have access to a boolean value called active, which is true if the effect is ticked on and false if not, so we'll include that here. The other method is called isTile compatible, and I'm not entirely sure what it does. Unity says if it can run on tile, which I figured might have something to do with tile based rendering on certain GPUs, but it's also marked obsolete for Unity 2023 and onwards. So if Unity are planning on throwing it in the bin, it can't be that important. I just return false and don't look back, and it hasn't broken anything so far. That's the blur setting script done, so we'll move on to the largest of the three scripts, blur render pass. We need to import the same namespaces as before, and this time the inherited type is scriptable render pass. This script is the brain of our effects, as it handles creating textures and materials, and it tells Unity how to apply the effect. This class requires us to override just one method called execute, but we will optionally also override configure and frame cleanup. I'm also going to add my own method called setup. This script requires a few variables, all of which can stay private. A material, which will hold our blur shader, a reference to our blur settings, a render target identifier called source, which is basically the screen texture before we apply our shader, a render target handle called blur text, which is an intermediate texture which holds the result of the first of our two blur passes, and an int called blur text ID, which I'll explain shortly. The setup method comes first. It does some one time setup for things that need to be ready before blur render pass can do anything, but it needs access to a scriptable renderer object which 
Christ, there's so many types to keep track of with similar names. The scriptable renderer object is the glue that holds together all the features supported by the renderer, the lighting, and the textures output by the camera. In our setup method, we'll retrieve the camera color target from the renderer, which is the camera output texture. We'll grab a reference to our blur settings script from the volume manager. If you have several volumes in your scene using a blur effect, then this get component method gets the correct one. Next, we'll set the render pass event. Essentially, we can make our blur effect run at a handful of predetermined points in the rendering loop. For a post-processing effect, like we're making, you'll pick either before rendering post-processing or after rendering post-processing, which are confusing names because we are doing post-processing, but the before and after in these names are referring to URP's already included post-processing effects like Bloom or Depth of Field. I'm choosing before, but if you're ever writing an effect and it doesn't work, swap it to after and that sometimes makes all the scary bugs go away. Lastly, we'll create a material to run our shader, but first, we need to check that blur settings is not null meaning the camera is inside a volume, which contains a blur effect, and that the effect is active. It has a strength above zero. If so, we'll find the shader using its name. Obviously, we haven't written the shader yet, but post-processing slash blur is the name I will be using. You might have noticed that the return type of the method is bool, so I'll return true if we successfully created a material, and false if not. Next up is the configure method override. This gets called each frame just before applying the effect, and we use it to set up any temporary resources required during this frame. It takes in a command buffer and a render texture descriptor as parameters. The command buffer is a list of instructions for the GPU to carry out, and the render texture descriptor describes the size of and sort of information stored in a texture in this case, the camera texture. Inside the method, I'll stop immediately if there's no valid blur effect. If there is, I'll create a temporary texture with an ID underscore blur text and exactly the same properties as the camera texture. Lastly, we'll call base.configure, which runs whatever code the base scriptable render pass class has in its configure method. Next up, we have the execute method, which has nothing to do with capital punishment. This is the core bit of the code across our three classes. This method runs once per frame, and we use it to set up shader properties and apply the shader to the camera texture. It takes a scriptable render context and a rendering data as parameters. The scriptable render context is a conduit for passing our instructions to the renderer, and the rendering data, uh, it's sort of in the name, I guess. Inside the method, I'll check again whether we have a valid blur effect. Then I'll create a command buffer using command buffer pool dot get and pass in a profile attack called blur post process. This identifier is used by the profiler to track the performance of our code. Next, we need to set up the shader properties that will be used for our effect. Our blur settings script dealt with only one property, the strength of the effect. From this, we'll derive two shader properties. If you remember me from earlier, for the grid size, I found that a grid size of about six times sigma works. Thanks me! I'll round it up to the next integer value, then add one if the result is even, so that our grid has a central pixel. Then, to set our shader properties, it's a matter of using the set methods on the material. There's a set method for each type, so for the grid size, I'll use set integer with the underscore grid size property, and for the spread, I'll use set float with the underscore spread property. We haven't written the shader yet, but those are the two property names I'll be using. With everything set up, we can now run the effect over the screen. For that, we use a method called blit which takes an input texture that we can read color data from, a texture that will write to, and optionally, a material to run over the first texture, and also optionally, a number representing which pass inside the material shader to use. Our shader will use two passes, so we're going to blit from the source texture, which is the camera texture, to our temporary blur texture using a horizontal blur pass, which has a pass index of zero, 
Then move from the blur texture back to the source texture with a vertical blur pass with an index of 1. Eventually, Unity displays that source texture on screen after all your post-processing effects have been applied. These blit commands get added to our command buffer, and to actually get URP to process those commands, we use context.executeCommandBuffer and pass in the command buffer as an argument. After that, we can clear the command buffer and then call command buffer pool dot release to clean up the resources related to the command buffer since we're now done with it for this frame. The only method left is frame cleanup, which we use to free up any resources we created during the frame. It's called at the end of the frame. You don't often need to deal with manual memory management like this in Unity, but be warned that if you don't clean up things like temporary textures after using them, you may encounter memory leaks and Unity will get upset with you. The only thing we need to free is the temporary blur text, which we can do with cmd.releaseTemporaryRT. We need to pass in the texture's ID rather than the texture itself. Then we can call base.framecleanup to run the default cleanup code. And that's the blur render pass script complete. Now we'll tackle the third and final script, blur renderer feature. This one only needs to import the unity engine.rendering.universal namespace. The inherit type this time is scriptable renderer feature, which needs us to overwrite two methods called create and add render passes. Before we write those, add a variable of type blur render pass to hold our pass. The create method deals with creating any passes and other resources your effect requires to work. In our case, we just need to create one blur render pass, but you might end up making complex effects with several passes. I'll also change the name variable to blur, which sets the default name of the renderer feature when we add it to our renderer features list. The add render passes method handles everything to do with inserting passes into the URP rendering loop. It takes a scriptable renderer and a rendering data as parameters. These are both types we've seen before. This is also where I'm going to call the setup method on blur render pass because this add renderer passes method gets called before the configure and execute methods on blur render pass. Setup also requires a scriptable renderer as a parameter and we conveniently have one right here. If you remember, setup returns true if everything got set up successfully and false otherwise, so we'll check the result with an if statement, and inside the if statement, we'll use nq pass to add blur render pass to our renderer. With that, all the C-sharp scripting is done and we can look at how the shader works. In the Unity editor, I'll create a resources folder inside my assets folder, then create a shader inside it via create, shader, unlit shader. I think all these presets were designed for the built-in pipeline, so we'll have to make heavy modifications to it, but we need a shader file to work with. I'll name it blur. The resources folder is important because usually, shader files are excluded from your game builds unless they're directly referenced within the material or by a script with a variable of type shader, and that material or script needs to be included somewhere in a scene. However, we're finding our shader by its name via the shader.find method which doesn't count as referencing it, so inside the resources folder, it goes. This shader file has a few key parts. The properties contains all the information we send to the shader. Then there's a subshader that includes most of the code. Inside the subshader, we have a tags list, an HLSL include block where we write shader code that gets placed inside every shader pass. And then after the HLSL include block, we have the horizontal shader pass, then the vertical shader pass, and that's it. Here's the basic code we're going to fill in from top to bottom. First, we have the name of the shader, which is going to be post-processing slash blur. This is the same name we used in our C-sharp code with shader.find. Next, we have the properties block, which contains three properties. Underscore main text is the input texture that get passed to the material with the blit method, and then underscore spread and underscore grid size are the two values we set on the material. I'm going to gloss over some of the shader syntax a bit because I've covered it in previous videos and there's a lot to get through, so if you're completely new to shaders, I would recommend watching my introduction guide to vertex and fragment shaders, then coming back here. Inside the subshader, we have the tags block, where I'll set the render type to opaque and the render pipeline to universal pipeline. This should prevent the shader being used on any other pipeline. 
Next up is the HLSL include block, where I'm going to put all the code that needs to be shared by both my shader passes. That includes importing the core shader library file and defining the E constant, which is 2.718, etc. Then I'll include all the variables I'm going to use, including the texel size of the underscore main text, which is basically its resolution. All the variables except the texture can go inside the Unity per material C buffer, which is one of the requirements for the SRP batcher compatibility. Then I'll write a function to generate the Gaussian curve values. Essentially, I run this equation, with the only input being the x-axis value and the shape of the curve being defined by the underscore spread property value. Next, and I'm going to speed through this, I'll write app data and v2f struts and the vertex shader, which are all extremely basic, and finally, we can cap off the hlsl include block with an end hlsl. After that, we can write our two shader passes. We'll start with a pass block, which I'll name horizontal. We'll open up an HLSL program block and use hash pragma statements to instruct Unity to use the vert function as the vertex shader and the frag underscore horizontal function for the fragment shader. Now, of course, we need to write that second function. Inside the function, first define a color variable which will accumulate the weighted color values from each pixel in the grid and a grid sum value which will accumulate the weights themselves. Then I'll work out lower and upper bounds for the grid. Basically, how many pixels to the left and right are sample based on the grid size. Now I'll loop over all of those pixels and for each pixel, I'll work out its Gaussian weight by using the Gaussian function we wrote, add the weight to our grid sum, then sample the pixel by adding a small offset to the UVs and multiplying its color by the Gaussian weight, then adding the results to the color variable. Once the loop has finished running, I'll divide the color variable by the grid sum. If you recall, the weights might not quite add up to 1, so I do this division to avoid getting a color that's slightly too dark. Finally, I'll return the color variable as the shader output. The second pass is almost identical, but with a few values swapped out, so I'll copy paste the entire thing, but change the name to vertical, change the fragment function name to frag underscore vertical, then change all the x values in the loop to y values. Crucially, I'll change this part of the UV calculation so that we're sampling pixels vertically, and that's the shader complete. There's just a bit more work to do before the effect can run in the scene. Find your universal renderer asset. In a new URP project, there should be a few in the settings folder. My game uses the one called High Fidelity by default. At the bottom, click the Add Renderer Feature button and find your blur effect. This step is very important as it basically enables our effect, although right now we don't have any volumes in the scene that can run the effect. Go ahead and add a volume via Game Object Volume and let's pick Box Volume. There's no volume profile attached to this volume, so click the New button and Unity will create a volume profile asset somewhere in your assets folder. We can add effects directly from this inspector window via the Add Override button, so once again, find your blur effect in this menu. Finally, tick the Override option next to the strength setting and increase it to something above zero. Then, whenever your camera passes through the box volume in either the scene view or the game view, your scene should blur. My thanks to all my Patreon supporters on screen right now. You can get access to premium shader packs, early access to videos and articles, or your name in these credits if you could become a supporter today. Until next time, have fun making shaders.